Okay, so we've got an awesome lineup of speakers that are going to talk about really sort of like wide ranging and different aspects of the pollinator pathway. First off is Louise Washer, who uh, normally I introduce to people as just like the person who heads this up, knows everything about it. Here you go. Talk to Louise. She'll straighten you out. Um, but she is Louise. I think I'm right that you're the president of the Norwalk River watershed uh, and what I would call our resident pollinator expert. Uh, after that, Melanie Hollis and Becky Collins, who are co-chairs of the Stanford Pollinator Pathway Group, they'll talk about you know, the projects that they've done, their partnerships with the municipality and how they built that out. Then we have Darina Bubakar, the founder and executive director of the Community Placemaking Network. We'll talk about uh, a number of projects that she's doing, but a really interesting angle to this, which adds in a youth entrepreneurial aspect and a way to actually build out jobs and uh, profitable environmental businesses out of this. And then last up, we've got Sarah Hutchison, who's a member of the Weston uh, Pollinator Pathway Steering Committee, who will talk about their very exciting No Mo May initiative. So with that being said, I'm gonna get out of the way and pass off to Louise. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen and um, let me see, this is always tricky to get out of the way to start my slideshow. And then someone said you can start it somewhere else. Does this happen to you guys that, um, oh, there we go. So thank you for giving me this shot at um, doing, I'm gonna really just do an overview of the pollinator pathway and um, what it is and how it's grown and how it is bringing together land, landowners, communities, and um, how it's been growing. So let me move my, my pathway. It is corridors, pathways of public and private property that provide pesticide-free native habitat for pollinators and birds. Um, so these, in this picture, these green blobs are the land, the parks, and the nature preserves that we've set aside for wildlife. But in between them are our properties. And so what we've in a sense done is fragment our landscape by just putting aside parcels. And so that doesn't allow for free movement of birds and bees and butterflies the way they need to. So the idea is that if we are, our properties, these little squares between the protected space, if we treat our properties as habitat and, and provide what pollinators need, we can connect those open spaces and we can defragment the land. This is just another image that shows the goal is to be this house in the middle down on the right um, that is providing nutrition and habitat and places to nest for, for pollinators and birds and is clearly connecting to this forest behind. Um, so that's just another image of, of the idea of what a pathway looks like and what we can do in our own yards. Why do this? Um, with the pollinator pathway, we one of its strengths, I think, is that we have a positive message that here are all these things you can do in your town and in your yard um, to help do something about the decline in pollinator populations. I think most people are familiar with. It's really hard to sort of live without seeing some of these headlines. Like I have picked out on the right um, that point out monarch populations are down actually more than 90% in the last 20 years. Um, people are familiar with colony collapse, which is uh, the declines in honeybee populations. Um, but our native bees are also in decline. There's a 96% decline in some North American bumblebee populations. And then the big study that Germany did, um, that happened in Germany that showed a 76% decline in all flying insects. That was like a really serious long-term scientific study that sort of got that, the result was these headlines that you see that we saw in the New York Times and stuff. Um, so it's on people's radars and everybody wants to, feels the weight of this, you know, problem and what can we do? Um, so the threats that, that pollinators are facing, loss, of, loss and fragmentation of habitat, we talked about, pesticides and lawn chemicals, um, invasive plants, native landscapes that lack uh, or sorry, landscapes that lack native plants. So like this picture of this house down here on the right, it's really about a loss of plant diversity, um, native plant diversity that our wildlife needs. Climate change is a factor and also light pollution, um, especially for moths and migrating birds and pollinators. Um, so outdoor lighting, if it can be on a um, motion detector switch instead of just on all the time. Um, I like to 
I'm throwing that in now because I've talked about this for so long and didn't focus on the light pollution and it's a huge thing. Um, but anyway, so for the, for the background of the pollinator pathway, um, in 2016, Connecticut passed the pollinator protection law. Um, part of that was to ban neonicotinoids, which are one of the pesticides most harmful to, um, to pollinators. So those are banned from retail sale now. Landscapers, licensed landscapers can still use them. So it's important to, if you do use a service to make sure they're not using neonicotinoids. But also at that time, um, Donna Merrill, who's here with us today, was working for the Hudson to Housatonic Regional Conservation Partnership. And she was tasked with looking for a way to reach out to landowners um, to engage them, to let steward their land um, more sustainably. And she read about the pollinator pathway. The idea came from an artist in Seattle um, about in about 2007, and it had traveled across to Oslo, Norway, and Donna read about um, a stretch of path, pollinator pathway. It was a bee highway, I think they called it, in Oslo. And she said, why don't we try that here? So we, she did, she, she did a pilot project with native dogwoods and then came back to Wilton where Donna works for the um, uh, Wilton Land Trust and at, invited me from the Norwalk River Watershed Association, somebody from uh, a, um, one of our nature centers and the garden club in Wilton. And we plotted out a path. You can see in this um, bottom picture, this sort of our early pollinator pathways, the way we were connecting them in, in the towns around Wilton. But from there, um, the pathway has grown. This map at the top is not quite up to date, but it shows um, the towns that are on the pathway. So it's 238 towns at this point in eight states. 78 Connecticut towns have joined. This other little map is just the one that we have on our homepage where you can actually put your property on um, the pathway so you can see all the, all the people who've chosen to do that. And the thing about the pollinator pathways, it's not, it's a grassroots movement, it's an idea. It's organized um, locally by town, by really existing conservation organizations, garden clubs that are already in most cases doing this work. And the pollinator pathway is sort of a platform, a way for people to reach out to each other and say, you know, we're worried, we're working on this pesticide issue. We're, we want the town to use native plants, let's work together. Um, and then it's organized overall by the steering committee, which is just uh, 14 people from different town uh, projects. And we work on creating the website, which is really the place everybody can come to download resources. When you start a pollinator pathway in your town or you wanna just get involved in your yard, you can find handouts, best practices, alternatives to pesticides, lists of plants to plant, you know, yard assigned for your yard. Um, if you're organizing for your town, you can have a page on the website for your town. Um, so anyway, I encourage you to check that out if you haven't looked at it. And the other reason that the pollinator pathway I think is working so well and we can't keep up with how many people wanna join, how many towns wanna to join um, is that it's scalable. You can, it can work in um, downtowns with containers along Main Street. It can work in apartment buildings um, with you know, window boxes. It can be more formal pollinator gardens like uh, the Aldridge Museum in Ridgefield has a kind of a formal, poll neat pollinator garden. And it can be bigger demonstration sites that land trusts or towns do put in meadows and things. And the message is simple, rethink your lawn, plant native plants and avoid pesticides. And I'm gonna just kind of go a little bit into each of these. Um, lawns are a, a problem. So rethink your lawn. <laughs> it, and part of the problem is that we have too much of them. We have 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. Um, they don't, pro, they're a monoculture. For the most part, we try very hard to make sure there are no, nothing but turf grass growing, um, which is one of the problems. So they provide, little habitat, food, shelter to, to pollinators. I mean, even having a little um, clover and violets is, is really important to the early pollinators. Um, but the other problem is they add, because they're not native, they require a lot of fertilizer and pesticides and water and the, those toxins and contaminants end up in our drinking water and in our streams. Um, and then also the root systems, are so shallow. You can see the root systems of the turf grass there on the left and they're just tiny. 
So when we storm water runoff is one of is the, the main um, reason that our rivers are contaminated are, are um, impaired. Mm -hmm. So as water comes off your driveway and off your roof and it's carrying all these oils and stuff and it goes onto the ground, if it sinks in where there are meadow plants like this with deep roots, those contaminants are cleaned out. But if it sinks in, sinks into a lawn, there's no root system to do that um, cleaning up of the water before it reaches the groundwater or a nearby um, stream or, or river. So that's, so I'm not a fan of lawns. I have a lawn, but I'm just, we're, our message is to rethink your lawn and to consider that, um, the water, they, lawns use a huge amount of water. And we have great statistics on this in Southwest Connecticut, because we had this five-year drought from 2012 to 2017. And we got all these numbers from Aquarian and we saw that in the summer, 70% of our water is used outside. Um, yards with irrigation systems use 40% more water. And the thing that people don't really think about is that this water is coming out of our rivers. It's coming out of the environment. Um, in um, Greenwich in 2016, at the height of that drought, they put there was a ban on irrigation systems and Greenwich, the town of Greenwich went from using 30 million gallons a day of water to using 5 million gallons a day of water. So that just really shows you what we're doing to the stream flow in our rivers. So I come from a water place to the pollinator pathway I, because I've worked for the Watershed Association. I'm drawn to this um, issue of people changing the way they manage their lawns um, because of I care about water so much. So I'm, I'm focusing on that. Um, but it's not just Connecticut. Nationally, 9 billion gallons of water a day are used on lawns. Um, so Rethink Your Lawn, we have tons of information on the website about how people can do that, how they can update. Um, and it is catching on Connecticut Magazine. This is the recent issue of Connecticut Magazine at the bottom. That's actually my yard. And we did No Mo May because of Sarah Hutchinson, who's going to speak later, and took a picture of it. And then it is catching on um, that people are, are rethinking. Um, this is actually Melanie's yard. Melanie's going to speak next. And Melanie took part of her lawn up, you can see on the left, and put in meadow plants um, and just, just reduce the size of her lawn. So I'd love to show that picture as an example of what you can do. Um, next, avoid pesticides, um, especially if we're gonna encourage people to plant for pollinators, we wanna make sure they don't use pesticides because then you create a trap, which is illustrated here on the right. I was riding my bike through my neighborhood on June 22nd, and I could see this pesticide sign that pesticides had just been sprayed right on this cat mint, which was covered with bumblebees. So it's the perfect sort of illustration of why it's better not to plant to draw pollinators if you're gonna then spray pesticides. Um, so again, we have tons of information on the website about alternatives um, to pesticides. So we can you know, answer people's questions, give them alternatives. This is the change we're looking for. These are our signs that show um, people's houses. You can put these on your mailbox or they can be on a stick like this in a garden. Um, but this is the goal, get rid of those yellow signs and replace them with, with our pollinator signs. Um, and then the last, the third point is plant native plants. And many of you have seen my talk before. I always use this um, story of the two dogwoods because it's such a great illustration of, of why it's important to plant native plants. Um, this is the blue azure butterfly up, into, up in the right. And it has co-evolved with our native dogwood. This is the um, little caterpillar in the middle. And you can see that he's sort of camouflaged with the branch of the native dogwood. This butterfly emerges at the same time that, but that our dogwood blooms and they need each other. And later in the season, the, the berries um, are food for our native birds. The other dogwood you see around is the Kusa dogwood, which I also have in my yard and it's beautiful. But these berries that, that come at the end of the season, they're food for this monkey in Japan. So this is the, the, the point is like, we need to plant plants that have co-evolved with our um, native insects, pollinators. And then I, I don't ever wanna not mention the importance of trees. Um, we do get calls from people who have cut down their trees because they wanna put in a meadow. And we're like, no, you know, trees are so important um, as larval host 
hosts for caterpillars. I think the white oak hosts something like 400 species of caterpillar. And um, also the, uh, many of them bloom. We don't think of trees as blooming, but um, the, the red maple is one of the first plants to bloom in the spring. And it's really important for early bees and um, pollinators. And same with the shrubs. So you don't have to put in a meadow to be supporting pollinators. You can put in trees and shrubs. Um, many of our, our native shrubs bloom early and that's really important for the early, for the first, the queen bumblebees that come out first. They come out before they lay their eggs. They need to find nectar and pollen before they can lay their eggs. And if there are no blooms for them, we don't get um, a colony of bumblebees. So um, we have, there's tons of information. What else do, can you do in your yard? Leave some old dead wood, some dirt patches, leave the leaves over winter because that's where many pollinators um, spend the winter and as, as eggs or pupa or in different stages. Um, and then I wanted to throw in, I don't know how I am on time. Am I doing okay? Hey. Um, I think you're good. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm trying to race through, but I wanted to throw this out. So citizen science is another part of Pollinator Pathway, and this is one project that is up and running that everybody can share in. Um, Pollinator Week this year is June 21st to 27th, and we have an umbrella Pollinator Pathway um, project on iNaturalist, which is an app. If you're not familiar, I'm happy to answer questions or talk to you later about it. Um, but you can go on iNaturalist, download it to your phone, join the Pollinator Pathway project, and then especially that week, take pictures of the pollinators you see and you know do this in your town. And it's really cool to see the thousands of pictures that people are looking at across the Northeast. Um, and then iNaturalist will identify the pollinators for you so you find out, oh, you know, this was a rare bee that I found in my yard or whatever, whatever you had, you know, great surprises. I've had like really fun with iNaturalist. Um, so that's a basic background of what Pollinator Pathway is. And um, it looks different in every one of the 238 towns. So there are so many stories. And what I'm excited about today is to hear from all these people that are doing different cool stuff. Um, and I really want to thank you, Abe, and Sustainable CT for that matching grant, because one of the most important things about that is that a lot of pollinator pathway, most, I think almost all pollinator pathway groups are not um, nonprofits. So they're not, they're cut off from applying for a lot of grants. So the fact that you can apply without being a 501c3 is just like huge. So thank you. Yeah. And I'm happy to answer questions. So thank, thank you for that. That was super informative for me. Like I said, I don't know a ton about this. So I loved learning all of that. My mind's gonna be going all over the place at the end of this after hearing everything. So uh, it'll take me a while to catch up. One thing, thinking about that matching grant. Next up, we have uh, Becky and Melanie from Stanford and they are right now running a community match fund crowdfunding campaign to plant native pollinator friendly trees in Stanford's parks. I'm gonna send the link in the chat in one second, but for any of you who, are interested, want to check it out, want to share it with others, let them know about what they're doing, or if you have the means and would like to donate to it, you'll be able to. Uh, they have run, I think this is the first fundraising campaign you guys have done, and it's been super successful so far. They set out with a $3,000 crowdfunding goal, already hit that, and have now upped it to 4,000 bucks. More money means more trees, means more habitat for pollinators. So uh, if you can, take a look, please spread the word, please donate if you can, um, and I'll pass off to you guys now to talk more about what you're doing. Thanks, Abe. So hi everyone, my name is Melanie Hollis. I am co-chair of the Pollinator Pathway Stanford with Becky Collins. We're gonna talk a little bit about how um, we initially started our steering committee and how we took a slightly different approach because Becky and I are basically backyard gardeners. Um, we don't have extensive backgrounds in landscape, um, architecture and knowledge of native plants and trees and shrubs. So I first heard about the pollinator pathway about two years ago. Um, I was at a Grace Farms event with Louise Washer was there um, at a table promoting the pollinator pathway. And she explained what the endeavor was. And I thought it was amazing. And when I went to sign up, she said, um, oh, I see that you live in Stanford. Uh, Stanford hasn't joined the pathway yet. So I decided, okay, well, Stanford has to be on the pathway. Um, I'll start this, and um, but I'm not going to need a lot of help because Stanford is large. So um, 
after convincing Becky, who, by the way, was perfect timing, had just retired. Um, so I convinced her to help me out. And because of our lack of um, knowledge and neither one of us was in a garden club, um, we decided, okay, we're both in a very active neighborhood association. Let's promote the pollinated pathway through other Stanford neighborhood associations. And because our neighborhood association had worked with the city in the past uh, a lot and collaborative on, uh, collaborated on a lot of different projects, let's reach out really early on into the process and tell our city contacts what we're doing and get them on board. So that will help us promote projects that we want to do in the future. So we set up an initial meeting with one of the senior parks planners that we had spoken to in the past. And ever since that initial meeting back in 2019, we've had an open ongoing dialogue with the city on what our goals are, what projects that we can do, what they can do to help us and how we can help them. So um, we don't have any slides. We're just going to be talking about primarily how we're working on uh, projects with the city. So I'll let Becky go from here. Okay, Abe, again, I, I say thank you for letting us tout our stuff, you know, with COVID being around, we tend to focus on all the stuff we could not do. We had to cancel our launch. We couldn't have, you know, programs that we wanted. Um, but as we sat down and started going over what we did, it was like, oh, okay, we got all this stuff done. So let's just keep moving on. Uh, one of the first things we did was we, as, as Melanie said, we met with the uh, park senior planner Erin McKenna um, as our first initial meeting and it went super she is so knowledgeable about all of this um, we had a presentation for them and Melanie and I discovered that there were 52 parks in Stanford and three meadows that we had no idea of um, as well as a farm right in the middle of Stanford called Fairgate Farm which is part of Stanford Hospital and Charter Oak Communications, which um, has the affordable housing in Stanford. And that was gonna be our first project, which was kind of canceled with COVID, but we're gonna resurrect it for um, this coming summer. We've been talking with them to get that going. Um, it was great because Aaron shared with us the um, master plan for the parks uh, that had been done a couple years ago. Larry Weiner was instrumental in doing a couple meadows and has more planned that were never done. Um, but we met with the city, went to a park to assess it. Uh, Larry Weiner was there donating his time and it, it was just really informative to us. As we said, uh, you know, we're, we're not master gardeners and meadows are kind of all new to us. Um, so we did that. Um, Aaron volunteered, Melanie and I both happened to love maps and loved going to these pollinator things where they had the city maps on there. Um, and Aaron volunteered to do a, a, a map just for the pollinators for Stanford, a GIS map. So we feed her addresses as we people pledge and we're gonna have that roll out pretty soon. Um, she gave us spreadsheets on where the parks were, uh, what their acreage was, uh, Stanford has a no pesticide um, in, in their parks, except where it's um, basically where it's harmful to people like poison ivy and things like that, they will spot spray, but um, they basically are using no pesticides on the parks going forward. Um, we talked to them about native plants versus um, non-native plants and they were pretty up to date on it. Uh, Melanie worked quite closely with uh, Ron Markey, who was a city arborist for trees in our neighborhood association. We met with him and, you know, just talked about how the trees are dying in Stanford, old age, storms, the weather, all, all that type of stuff. And he was most receptive. Um, you know, we talked about what we could possibly do in the future, but all these people were just super um, helping us kind of formulate where we were gonna go because we originally thought we'd just roll it out association to association, but it, it, in reality, it went very different. Um, we also met with the parks and facilities managers. Um, they mentioned to us that they had an ongoing trial of organics. The, the playing fields, oddly in Stanford, um, can have 
pesticides and fertilizers and stuff, but they're moving to, they did a uh, test on one of the ball fields down at Cove Park, which went well. They're starting another test on another field. Um, so the city is now pesticide free. When we met at a park with the city employees, um, that the maintenance men that happened to be there, um, the pesticides came up and they were right there forward in the front saying, nope, can't use pesticides, can't do that. So their maintenance people are on board with this. So our, our goal is more education on how important all these are, like every, natives and no pesticides and rethinking your lawn. So we are working with the city closely to do a couple projects at this point, which I will turn over to Melanie and she can take the rest of the story. Okay, so um, our next step after meeting with some of the um, parks people was to go, my background is um, in architectural services. So I am um, was focused more on zoning and blight ordinances. And so one of the first things we did was check that Stanford does have a city ordinance and there is a, a blight ordinance um, for a turf grass being too high. So it was perfect timing to speak with our land use bureau chief, Ralph Blessing. Um, he was engaged in overhauling our old existing Stanford uh, zoning regulations. Uh, and at the same time, we were thinking, well, maybe we could get him to implement some native language into those zoning regs and possibly uh, change to amend the blight ordinance. Um, for the blight ordinance, we didn't want to promote um, meadows and no mow may um, too much in the beginning because we didn't want um, people to be able to uh, get a blight violation. Um, it, it's very prevalent in Stanford for people to call on overgrown lawns. So in Stanford, our blight ordinance is stated that if you have turf grass over nine inches, it's considered blight. So we set up meetings with uh, Ralph and Aaron. They invited the two land use and um, blight ordinance attorneys for Stanford to the meeting. Um, prior to the meeting, we submitted a paper on why native language and meadows are important to the city of Stanford and in general to the environment and ecology. So we submitted that and, and within that report, we did a spreadsheet of other ordinances throughout the country. We divided it out by city and town, the square miles of each town the population of that town or city, and then a summary of their ordinance. So in this way, it was very easy for Ralph to look at that chart and say, okay, this is, this is the size of Stanford, this is our population, this city is doing this so we can do this as well. So we were, we were cruising along and then COVID hit and it kind of stopped our, our talks for a bit, but we're back, um, we, we started back up again in January. We, we were successful in getting some native language in part of the zoning regulations, it was, it's a new section that they call uh, it's a sustainability scorecard for new construction and apartment buildings. So if developers use the native plant languages, we, we were able to implement a percentage, um, they get extra points for their scorecard in Stanford. Um, and as far as the blight ordinance, uh, we have decided to go through um, to use they, they're going to keep their existing blight ordinance and there's going to be an exception for a managed mat natural meadow landscapes. So we're incorporating that exception and um, within that exception will be definitions of what a native plant means, what an invasive plant means, what a non-native plant means, and then what turf grass is the definition of it. Um, so, and then on top of the uh, land use bureau, at the same time, we were speaking a lot with, with the Parks and Rec Commission. Um, because of our early contact with the city of Stanford, um, one of the meadows that uh, Becky had mentioned was in threat of being cut down and turned back into turf lawn. And this was in one of our public parks. So um, the city of Stanford, uh, our senior parks manager, she reached out to us and asked us to present to the Parks and Rec Commission why Meadows are important. So again, we, we pulled together really quickly a paper. Uh, we, we spoke and presented the paper at the commission. Um, several of our members spoke and uh, happy to report that the Parks and Rec Commission uh, 
it was in support of keeping the meadow. They, they denied the request to remove the meadow and turn it into turf grass. But because of that meeting, uh, since then, we've really developed a relationship now with the Parks and Rec Commission where they'll connect us with other, other volunteer groups that are want to do work or are doing work in the, in the public parks. And that's really opened up like a, more of a well of different volunteers that we, we could possibly use or we could help. And um, I guess the, the other thing would be that through the Parks and Rec Commission, the, um, they're, they're more of an advisory commission, but they have a big branch. So it's, they encompass the, the playing fields as well. So it's really a good way for us to keep up to date on what Becky was talking about and how far the city is going to take this organic playing field. And at some point, if we need to go to the, our board of reps to say, you know, we are in, we are for the organic playing fields, and you know, the the parks and rec department and the and the parks and rec commission need more help. That's something that we can we can help them do. Uh, and then lastly, as Abe had mentioned in the very beginning, we're doing um, match fund through Sustainable Connecticut current right now um, for planting native trees in our public parks. And again, this was one of the first thing that we did um, after speaking with Abe, we went directly to uh, Ron Markey, the city arborist, and we went to Aaron McKenna, the seniors park manager, um, or a planner, I should say, and um, asked them, is this something that the city would like to collaborate? Could you plant these trees for us if we um, raise the money and, and buy the trees? And they were so excited to partner with us. So. Um, we've hit our goal we're trying to um make this extra goal so everyone <laughs> spread spread the link um and what would be really great is as becky had said a lot of our trees in our public parks have due to storm damage or disease have died and they need to be replaced and the cities and most cities don't have a lot of budget anymore and the budget for trees and um, parks keeps getting cut. So we feel any way that we can to help the city and the people in the city who really, really would like to plant more natives and plant trees and just don't have the budget. This is a way for us to help facilitate some of these projects. Um, and you know, the city has been really receptive. They've reached out to us when they have questions They've reached out to us on certain other projects that they want us to help on. So it's been a really, really good experience. And I think because, because Becky and I didn't have the same background and we went in a different route, it's kind of, it's helped um, the pollinator pathway become a little bit more relevant in, in, within the city government, which is, which is very helpful. So that's it. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> We're done. Great. Thank you, guys. Also, there are a ton of questions in the chat. So if the two of you are, aren't looking in there, folks are curious about the sustainable scorecard, how you guys uh, pulled together on meadows, uh, the blight or ordinances, things like that. As for the most part, let's hold questions until the end. And then, you know, once the presentations are done, we can sort of open it up just for informal conversation and questions. But if you guys want to take a look at those there, if you have info, feel free to send it to me and then I'll send it out to everybody afterwards. So, folks, we, we will get all that info out to you. Uh, Doreen, you are up to talk about what CPEN is doing in New Haven. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our, poll our pollinator pathway journey. <laughs> um, basically, in 2016, uh, New Haven signed on to the uh, um, Bird Migration Treaty. And my particular garden on the Farmington Canal. Um, which is a block long pollinator garden uh, was a signer on to that treaty for New Haven in 2016. From that, I attended a pollinator conference. And at the pollinator conference, that's when I first heard about this pollinator pathway. And, um, you know, I consider myself to be an urban environmentalist. So for me, it's all about how do I bring nature, uh, information, what issues are facing the city into the urban, more urban neighborhoods in our city. So um, 
when I heard about the pollinated pathways, I said to myself, oh, wow, I'm also vice president of Elm City Parks Conservancy. So with that title, I oversee all of the friends parks, uh, all the parks with park friend groups uh, throughout the city. And uh, so I said to myself, oh my goodness, we want to be the lead uh, with this. So with Elm City Parks, along with myself, my own uh, founded nonprofit organization, um, with Elm City Parks, our mission is to establish New Haven Pollinator Pathway as an urban greening effort to bring native plants to the city, particularly to low income neighborhoods in the effort to defragment the environment by creating an urban link for our local pollinators. So I've been advocating for like over 30 years. I started with Richie Havens when he founded something called the Natural Guard. For many years, I have been, you know, pretty much the African American who has been involved in um, issues centered around. Uh, the city of New Haven in regards to environments. First started out with watershed education because we have an urban watershed. Um, so I'm the founder of the West River Water Festival. Uh, we just went through our 10th year. I've gotten awarded from uh, the state for that type of initiative. And I still continue today to teach watershed education uh, in uh, after school programs. Um, so the idea of this neighborhood that I adopted called New Hallville has 6,500 people in a one mile radius, 98.8% residential. And I was like, what can I do to lighten the people here, to give them hope, to give them inspiration? And so we're right now using um, you know, pollinators and the more that I'm learning about it, we have created a place that's called the Urban Scapes Native Plant Nursery. New Haven does not have a public nursery. So we created it in a vacant lot in this neighborhood. And um, last year, as you can see this picture, Pollinator Pathway, you know, thank you to all of the people who came out. They raised money for us for these uh, beds and uh, the teens there built them. And the idea was that we were going to plant pollinator plants in pots and that the plants would grow in these. Now, this was just the first level of the bed. We actually have three levels. So this is like 36 inches tall. And um, at the end of the season, I think it was uh, the beginning of September, we had our big plant sale. And, you know, within like three hours, we sold out 300 12 or so plants. And uh, with those funds, we were able to bring those back. Um, we were able to purchase this year, a greenhouse. So I have a background in entrepreneurship. I taught for the labor department, how to start your own small business for those who were in transition for many years. And my goal has been how to create an entrepreneurial business, economic development kind of business in this place that has a whole bunch of people, a lot of vacant lots and housing, right? And so uh, last year, it was very successful. Uh, Lois had a chance to meet our kids and everything. Um, the kids that we worked with last year, there were so many people that we worked with that were really impressed that, you know, here you have these urban kids. A lot of times we hear a lot of negative things about them. Um, but they were engaging, they wanted to learn, they were excited about being a part of the process and excited about learning how they could do something that can actually help them with money. So, you know, during the COVID, people were losing jobs. So how were these teens finding jobs? You know, that's the that's something that kids look forward to when they turn 16 is to finally work for somebody and make a little income for themselves. We was able to show them that you could do this by learning to do something and providing something that people are looking for. So Mamakatuck Audubon, which is the Shoreline Audubon, uh, uh, their president befriended me in the watershed arena. And he and I developed this together. 
and now with the support of Pollinator Pathway, and all we do is keep. That's why I love network and all the in the names of things that I do, because I realize that it takes more than me. I consider myself to be the visionary. I consider myself to be the bridger of stuff, and so with the collaboration of us all, you know, we are now trying to establish an actual native plant nursery. And people who brought from us last year have already been reaching out to see what are we growing this year. So we're really excited about now going to, we'll be growing uh, 1500 plants this year. And so while we're growing these things, the kids are also learning, you know, this plant, who does it attract, right? Is it a shrub? Is it, is it for the nectar? Uh, is it for habitat? Things like that. And then uh, our project with Abe, if you, uh, let me see, I got, do you have the I picture? I already the posted project? it in the, do you want me to share the screen for it? Yeah, yes. Give me a second and I'll start talking while I pull that up. Well, out. I have it, I have it up if you. Uh, yeah, you, if you wanna share your screen, go ahead. Or okay. I can. Okay. Can you see that? No. Can you guys see that? How do I share? Here, right, I'll, I'll do it. I got it pulled up. Okay. So um, for me, it's all about building. When we saw that growing the native plants and selling the na native plants was lucrative. <laughs> I mean, lucrative. I mean, to go from buying plants for two or three dollars to being able to sell plants from 10 to 20 dollars. And people did not I mean, it was never, it was no haggle over, you know, can I get this, can I get two for three, you know, or, or something like that. So it was just really amazing. Um, so, okay, so up at the top, I think is the picture. Where's the picture of the, yes, go to, okay, so this is a project. I do a lot of research. So I, I was looking around and I said, okay, I'm in a real urban neighborhood here. What can we do that would be a part of the rain garden, pollinator, watershed stuff? And this has all three. So this is called a downspout planter. It's, a, it's like planting a rain garden in a box. And so um, we found some plans of how to build it and things. And that's what we did as our fundraiser online where the kids will get paid. We'll have a contractor work with the kids uh, to cut the wood and all that other stuff. And then we, as uh, the urban, the urban scape nursery want to see how feasible it will be for us to actually grow some of the water plants. And in the grant, it was about the kids learning about this system and stormwater management so that they can explain to people who may want to purchase this system. So this is going to be a sellable system as well as something that's small enough that should that would not um what's the word i want to use that would work in a in a more urban neighborhood where you have you know two and three family homes and you know stuff like that and so this is the project that we're working on now so i just wanted to say that uh the, the real thing that has really brought ex excitement to me is being able to find the people who are willing to share with us in New Haven. And I can't say that in New Haven, we have a lot of environmental groups, but um, the difference in this type of work is I'm the visionary. So when I came to Pollinator Pathway, I asked them, can they help us with this? They didn't come in with what they wanted to do, right? And so it's really about building that relationship and going into neighborhoods and sharing your skill sets, sharing your knowledge, sharing, sharing your connections, your resources. Um, and I mean, we've been just able to grow by leaps and bounds with the connection that we have with Pollinator Pathway um, and, and also uh, Mamakatuk Audubon. And I think that's all I wanna share. I think, I think, uh, yeah, if I could just, I wanted to show one picture. Okay, go to screen, go here, share, and then go here. So I made this little collage, you know, 
of the process of the pollinators. We, we went to one, to one lot and grew the plants here, and then we had to move them. You can see in this picture here, the tall box, how tall those, those plants are, like three feet tall. This is the vacant lot in this urban community that we're transforming to have many different things. And then down at the bottom here is the picture of um, pollinator pathway and their, their sign there. So we're looking forward to continuing our, our project here. And um, okay. So uh, <laughs> you know we're we're starting to recruit the teams. So we're excited. Thanks, Doreen. That is an awesome series of projects. And I know that there's also more to come. So uh, in the chat, I let everybody know that the Down South Planter project is already funded, but there may be future right. community match fund projects uh, in line with this. So keep your eyes on the patronicity.com slash sustainable CT website, and you may see some more work that Doreen is doing and everybody else here too. Right. Um, so next up, let's pass off to Sarah, who's gonna tell us more about Nomo May and Weston, which I know we already heard a little bit about. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here. What inspiring stories from Doreen and from Melanie and Becky. <laughs> Hard to follow on from that. But um, my name is Sarah Hutchison. Uh, I'd like to thank Louise and Abe for creating this forum. I'd like to say hello to all the Western people on the, on the call. Um, and I'm here to talk about No More Me. So let's talk about No More Me. What is it? Um, so I'm Scottish. And I was introduced to this concept last year by the UK charity Plant Life. They launched a campaign called Every Flower Counts. And it was to challenge people to not mow their lawn for four weeks and count the flowers and, you know, see all the pollination that happened in that period. So what we did here in Weston is we tried to roll this out and encourage people to participate. I call it my lockdown lawn. Um, but here's the, the plant life uh, article that, that got our attention. And here is the Connecticut Magazine article that Louise talked about earlier. Um, and the great thing about Louise is that she leads by example. Um, so it's nice that we have this support from, from Louise. Um, but the long-term motivation for us here in Weston, um, we have two acre uh, lots here in town. We have a lot of lawns and we have a lot of unused lawn. So we're just trying to get people to look at their lawn differently and rethink what they can do to create habitat. And this to me, not mowing for four weeks is pretty easy to do. So the next thing is, why do we do no mow me? So when I joined the pollinator pathway in 2019, I was shocked by uh, just the statistics around the lawns. Um, the fact that manicured turf is the largest irrigated crop in the country, blew my mind. Um, when you think about all the acres of land that we have as lawn, 50 million acres is the same size as New England. Um, to create this perfect green uh, desert, we use 3 trillion gallons of water, 200 million gallons of gas for mowing and blowing, uh, and 70 million pounds of pesticides that end up in our waterways, creating this toxic algae and, and you know, killing all the aquatic life. Um, and this here really does uh, provide zero habitat. So I've added this illustration from um, Harvard Magazine because it illustrates almost like my lawn story. Uh, this perfect lawn with the, the sprinklers is how I started. And then I joined the pollinator pathway and, you know, I started to rethink my lawn and just create like a mow strip and, and let it grow. And now in the middle here, my goal is to try and fill as much uh, native plants as possible in the areas that we don't use. So what did we do here in Weston? Um, so what we did is we created these lawn signs as a fundraiser and uh, we were pretty much just trying to give per people permission to be messy. <laughs> um, we have the Weston pollinators at work on one side and then we created a no mow and no spray uh, on the, the other side. And people are putting this at their uh, mailboxes next to their mailbox signs. Uh, and really it's just a signal that they're on the pathway, but also to our town DPW. We met with them and we asked them if they would honor our signs. They come through and they mow in the summer, uh, usually two or three times a summer. 
and they had agreed that if we, uh, you know, as long as there's no safety issue, they will honor our signs. And this year, um, what we're going to do is try and expand it and write to our town officials. Um, Melanie and Becky has, have given me some ideas. Um, I'll need to talk to them after this, but we're going to re reach out to our town officials, our local beekeepers, our local farmers, and invite them to participate and start spreading awareness of no more um, You know, especially the areas alone that are not used or, uh, on a hillside. To me, that seems like an easy area to just leave, leave me. Uh, so let's talk about the results. So this is my garden. So on the left hand side here, this is a picture that was taken last May. Um, before we didn't know it at all. And we have a lot of violets. We have the dandelions. Um, there's a couple of other flowers here that came from a seed packet that I sprinkled. Um, but if you fast forward four weeks to early June, you can see the grass has grown uh, quite tall and we have a lot more flowers. And I have to say, when I was over there taking these pictures, the whole area is completely buzzing with life. It's amazing just how four weeks you can go from this uh, to just a, a, a really uh, vibrant, vibrant area of lawn. So in my lawn, in my circumstances, this was a traditional lawn. Um, it has been chemical free since we bought the property, but it had been treated by chem uh, with chemicals by the previous owners. Um, what we did is in 2019, we overseeded with red clover and a native wildflower mix. Um, and in our case, the presence of the wildflowers was instant. A lot of these are annuals, um, so they came up pretty quickly. But even without putting this, uh, the seed mix down, you'll still have lots of lawn violet, many types of clover and dandelions, and it's still providing a really strong habitat for our early emerging insects. And one thing that I was uh, surprised by is the area of lawn that I just left. Uh, we actually had goldenrod, you know, which is, uh, which is a, a, a happy accident. <laughs> So I just wanted to end and, uh, you know, just give you some helpful resources that we use here in Weston to promote this. Obviously, uh, Louise talked about the Pollinator Pathway website. Uh, that has so much great information. We've linked here to an uh, article called We Think Your Lawn. Uh, Xerces, they have a ton of information too. They had this particular blog just talking about be friendlier lawn care. It just really, it talks about all the American studies that have happened uh, that, that just, just demonstrate how letting your lawn flower really helps our, our pollinators. Uh, NOFA are a, a really good local uh, organization who have a lot of online education for homeowners and for landscapers. And you can actually, you know, research your landscapers through them and make sure they've had the NOFA training, which is helpful. Uh, the Aspetuck Land Trust in town are one of our partners. They are also rolling out their Green Corridor, which is the same kind of message as we have. Uh, Homegrown National Park, which is Doug Tallamy's hub, uh, in answer to his call for us all to rethink our backyards as habitat. Uh, and then the National Wildlife Foundation has a native plant finder which has been, uh, it's basically Doug Tallamy's research. And I love this tool because if you put in your zip code, it will give you a list of all the top, uh, you know, keystone plants in your area. So when you're looking to plant natives, this would, this, the, these would be the, the links that I would suggest. Um, but that's, that's all I've got. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I may have to refer my parents over to you for their lawn because they've tried to do something similar, but it, it doesn't look nearly as good as yours. So uh, <laughs> maybe I'll send them your email and say, hey, reach out, figure out how to do this. Patience. It takes a lot of patience. <laughs> Uh, well, so thank you. Thank you, everybody who's spoken. This has been super interesting. At this point, I think, I know we're getting close to 11 o'clock. So like I said, if anyone, speakers, attendees, if you need to jump off for other meetings or anything else, feel free to go. But I'm happy to stay on till at least 1130. Uh, so right now, this is just meant to be totally informal, open for conversation, questions, things you might be doing, stuff you want to know from the speakers. If you got a question, just unmute and feel free to ask. This is Suzanne Thompson and Old Lyme. Don't mind the picture here. Um, I have a messy background. I just want, I just posted on the chat 
But I wanted to thank Louise and the other organizers. When I reached out months ago to get launching, I said, can I use pieces of your PowerPoint presentation? And so those graphics work out wonderfully. You do not need to reinvent a wheel. <laughs> so share the resources. I have a question, Abe. Um, I wanted to ask Doreen, because I, I knew you did that downspout project, but I didn't, did you guys make those, um, the, the wooden containers? Did your kids make those or did you order those? Yeah, we're gonna be making them. You're making We them? raised the funds to make them. Okay, that's so cool. I think that's like a great idea to share with other cities. So I might send people to you. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're in our prototype because I know nothing. I'm just a visionary. So we have to, we had to get a contractor that's drawn up the plans. He has to be able to teach teenagers how to build them. Um, the money is to uh, build four uh, this year. This year we will place them, install them somewhere. Um, and then hopefully moving forward, um, we can continue making them. But, you know, the pricing, the time, all that's going to be uh, figured out during the developing the prototypes. Doreen, we've got a, a question in the chat here about whether you have an online presence and how folks can purchase the plants. Um, last year, Mamukatuk Audubon had placed uh, orders on their website for it, for them. Uh, um, Louise has uh, advertised through her Buzz uh, newsletter also. So Doreen, we you, will... could, you could put it on the Pollinator Pathway website on the New Haven page. We could do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also have a question on, on the downspout. How big are they? And did you have to water them in the middle of the summer? How, how, how deep is the soil? For the downspouts, uh, we just... We raised the money and, you know, like literally in May. No, I, I uh, want to know how, how large is the actual garden? And did the you box have to- for it? Uh, the, box the box is for like, it. Uh, is about um, three feet by four. Okay, so you have almost four feet of soil in there for them to go down. And did you have to water in the middle of the summer when it was so dry? So we, we didn't make one yet. Um, yeah. all we, you know, that's the plans, but I do have a picture that I could show of, um, Doreen, well, you're pulling that up. I also misread the initial question. I'm sure lots of folks are curious about buying the plants, but Cheryl's question was actually about once the, um, the planter boxes, the downspout planters are made, if there'll be a way for folks to buy them. So I, I realize yes. that's now that's ahead of things, right? Cause we, you've got the the prototype designed by the contractor, but the kids haven't actually gotten out there and, and made them yet. So um, that may be yet to come. Yes, um, the, you know, we do things slowly, you know, we, you know uh, but yes, if we find that uh, we could do them quickly, then we can take orders and build like that as well. But we'll have them either built and the kids can actually come and install and or it could be brought as a kit. That's the idea thus far. Yeah. Uh, Doreen, so thinking about this, both for the plants and the downspouts, if you're comfortable with it, I can share your email. I'll send out, so at the end of this, I'll send a recording or a link to the recording of the webinar for anyone that joined late, early, whatever had to drop off. And so uh, in that email, I can also send your contact info to folks if that's okay with you so that they could reach out to, to make orders. Um, and what I'm gonna do also is put inside the chat the, um, the website address for the New Haven pollinators, and people can join that so that you can keep up with everything that we're doing in regards to the plant sale and also um, the, uh, the boxes. Awesome, thanks. Louise, we've got a question here about uh, where on the website people can find the signs. I am just posting that. So, so there's a, a place on the website where you can order them individually and I'm putting in that link. And then if you, I was just typing this out, but I won't have to, if you wanna order in bulk for your town, you can email us, I'll put in the email um, cause we can provide them at cost for towns that wanna then distribute them themselves. But just to buy one or two, you can do that easily on the website. So I'm just posting it right now. Awesome, thanks. 
Uh, I'm also realizing now there was a question a while back during um, Melanie and Becky, your presentation about how the land was assessed. I, I don't have the context anymore, so I'm not actually totally sure what that was about. If that rings a bell for you guys, go ahead and answer. Otherwise, Katie, if that's still an outstanding question, feel free to chime in. Well, I'm, I'm not sure where that appeared, you know, when that oh, appeared that we were talking, so I'm not quite sure. I'll what... tell you, um, I'll tell you, basically what you were describing was how you were inventorying and assessing and amassing your maps. And then you were talking about how you had assessed the land for, I guess, for pollinator possibility or something like that. And I wondered how, what that assessment process was. So we, we, don't part, we don't assess any land. Um, what we do for the map that Becky was talking about um, earlier is that when somebody signs up for the Stanford Pollinator Pathway, uh, their address goes into a, a, a data format sheet that we're able to send then to the city and they upload it into the GIS system. So we're able to, um, see at the at, at the end of different target months how many um, areas are green on the map and by seeing that information then we're able we will be able to eventually see where we're starting to get pockets of connected properties and where we need to target different neighborhoods that say are um, a disconnected or like we said a fragmented neighborhood so then we can start tailoring our outreach to certain areas of Stanford. Does that so answer means, your question? Yes, except for that means that you're looking for certain attributes in land. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but you're, you're looking for certain attributes of land quality in order to... Um, well, I, we're, we're just ask people um, when they sign up, like our pledge is very simple. So we ask people to have planted one native tree, shrub, or a oh. flower plant on their property. And uh, they just have to uh, refrain or avoid using pesticides. It's, it's pretty simple. simple. Um, okay. Yeah, so. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'll just jump in real quickly. Um, because, you know, as we said, we're, we're backyard gardeners. I mean, Melanie, you saw her front yard. I mean, she did a wonderful job on those gardens that she put in the front. Mine was a little, is, is a much slower process. My first process before I put my sign out was to get rid of the two barberry plants I had in my front yard, which my husband loved. <laughs> so we, we had marital counseling to get through this. Um, Barberry. Eventually, between Melanie and I, um, we got rid of the two Barberries and put in two replacement plants, which are starting to bloom now. This this is this will be the first spring. We put them in last fall, so we're starting in different different directions. I'm, I'm I mean I'm a much slower start. I learned how to winter sow this year. Um, there's so much to this um, that it's really interesting. Yeah. One question that just came in the chat, and I, I think this is for anybody here that's been involved with the pollinator pathway in your town across the state, is just what are the things you do to help get the word out to folks to make them aware of this, right? Because I, I think this is one of the things that at least I think about with this. People might see a garden and it might have, it might be all native plants and have great ecological benefits, but a, a non-discerning gardener or passerby doesn't necessarily know the difference between that and uh, non-native plants. So uh, has anyone had any success or done any interesting things to, to really make folks aware of this who aren't actively seeking out doing this? I mean, I put one thing in the chat. I, I think before COVID and, and we've still done it a little bit during COVID, um, but having volunteer events, you know, in, in town, maybe on a, in a park or some kind of shared open space where you, where you take out the invasives and you help people identify the you know, primary invasives. And then you have some native plants like that you get through a match funding grant possibly um, <laughs> that you can put in then people can see them and say, oh, oh, wait a minute, I have this barberry in my yard, but look at this beautiful blue lobelia, like we all replace it with this. I mean, I do think that 
that, and then those people go home and do it. But the other, um, the other thing I think that I've seen work really well is partnering with the town library um, or the city library and doing these kind of talks. And really, honestly, like we have been talking about bringing together towns to share what they're doing, like what you've done here, Abe. And this is so great. I think this is a good way to spread the word, um, you know, sharing with each other. We want to do a conference for the Pollinator Pathway. We've just COVID interrupted it, but um, everybody has so much to share. So trying to get together somehow um, to talk about it. Uh, thanks, Louise. I think one interesting thing, and Leslie from Chaplin was on the call. I think she may no longer. Oh, Leslie, you're still here. Good. So sorry to put you on the spot, but I know you guys are doing something very cool right now. Uh, Mansfield, Chaplin, and Wyndham are, there are three different, I think, sustainability committees are all getting together to, uh, to try to promote this on a multi-town level. So it's a neat example of uh, uh, taking it from, you know, one house, one town, and actually it's a pathway. So expanding it to neighboring towns. Leslie, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yes, thanks, Abe. Um, we're the newest town. I'm, I'm, I'm from Chaplin. We're the third um, of the three, and Wyndham has has, has quite a um, has quite a project already underway. And Mansfield is is following nicely, and so we're kind of playing catch up. But um, one reason I got involved, and once I heard about it, is that we're starting a, a bicentennial arboretum next year for to dedicate next year for our big celebration. And um, because of, of um, becoming aware of um, pollinator pathways, we're focusing on pollinator trees and, and bushes to put in this arboretum. And uh, someone already earlier said that they were focusing on, on education. Um, and that's gonna be a goal of ours too, or a future goal. Once we get these pollinators in and, and it's gonna become quite a nice Nice feature of our town that to have people come and learn about pollinators. So, um, I'm and right next to this property is a Joshua's Trust property, which um, is that they have an emphasis on um, on the environment and pollinating. So it's it's to me to me that that's a no brainer co collaboration. But these three towns, these the um, Wyndham is the largest in population, but we're fairly rural out here in Chaplin, and I think it's going to be a nice. A nice continuation pathway in northeastern Connecticut. I have a question for you, Leslie. I'm Marjorie Mikoff from the East Lyme Pollinator Pathway. How did you acquire the land for this arboretum? Uh, that the land was already purchased, uh, Marjorie. It was uh, it was part of the town's um, recreational recreation commission uh, oversees it. And it had been used for a little league and, and that kind of thing forever. Uh, but but we um, we thought for the bicentennial, could we have an arboretum? And, and fortunately, the the DPW chair or uh, the, the foreman of the DPW is an arborist, and he just fell over when we suggested it. And um, and 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 he's been a real a real inspiration to us and and and, and focusing on. Uh, getting native species of trees planted there and and bushes too so it's that was very fortunate i have to agree thank you leslie i can't let you uh mute yourself again without giving a little shout out to your crowdfunding campaign though so the chaplain arboretum project was oh. a community match fund campaign it was the first crowdfunding effort that leslie dave from public works and chaplain and her partner on this uh, helen had done and they set out to raise, what was it, 2750 and ended yeah. up raising like $8,000. So right. it just kept like four times over, kept pouring in. And I think there's a, a phase two in the works now, right? Right. We're a three phase project. And then this year is phase two. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that, Abe. <laughs> Too successful not to mention. Sue, That's I see right. you got your hand up. But you're also on mute. I think we also have to concentrate on not saying that people are feeling that we're saying you got to rip out your whole garden and put in natives. And I think we have to say anything you put in now, put in native <clears throat> and take out your invasives, which we've been saying for a long time. But um, I, I think it's Edwina von Gaal had it two, three, four birds. And for, for every two, three plants that you put in, put in two natives and one, you know, if you have one non-native. 
But I think they were scaring off some people by saying, oh, this is too much for me. So uh, uh, concentrating on how to say, how do you start small, which some of you have, and it's a long-term process. We have a meadow at our library and this is its fifth year and it's still, yeah, <laughs> we hope. Um, you know, let me mention again, Doug Talmy, I can't find the exact link to it, but it was on the University of Delaware site. They're saying it's that 70% rule, you know, aim yeah. to be 70%. Don't, don't beat yourself up. We, we all know we plant things so the deer won't eat them. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of part of the reason we're in the mess that we're in <laughs> and the deer are still here. You know, so, so is that, I, it's kind of like reducing salt in your diet. You know, they're not, they're not telling you to take it all out. <laughs> no, no, but that's a little bit of the feedback that I've gotten from some people. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not listening anymore because I can't do it. Yeah. And so that's, I'm just saying we have to also point out what you can do with what you already have. Okay, so maybe it's more like adding more fiber to your diet. <laughs> exactly. Adding yeah. more fiber and yeah. taking out the sugar. Yep. Yep. So one thing, I see a question in here, which looks like it's uh, directed at me, although I'm actually going to divert it over to those of you on the call who have led crowdfunding campaigns, because you know more about this than I do. But uh, Donna asked how we publicize the crowdfunding campaigns. So on sustainable CT side of things, we put out, or there's a standard press release template that either project leaders or we send to local media in the hopes that they carry it. And that generates sort of passive knowledge for folks. Um, we'll post on our social media, get the word out to people we know who might be interested. But I don't wanna overstate the, the support. We're given the dollars as the matching grant, but ultimately uh, we're not doing anything, right? Like it's these local groups, it's the people who we're talking today who are really spearheading this, doing the work, uh, publicizing it to their communities, getting people engaged, driving their donations. Um, so we help where we can. We try to get the word out through our networks, but ultimately it's the local groups who are leading the projects and tapping into their community, who are the, uh, the people who drive the crowdfunding campaigns. And in part, that's just because for the most part, what we see, I mean, I could pull up maps that we have that show donors and the entire state is covered in donors. The country has donors all over the place. There are some internationally. But uh, by and large, when you look at where donations to these projects come from, it, it's local people. It's predominantly people who live in the town. So you can see, you know, it says if it's a Stanford project, most of those donations are going to be Stanford. So it's really local people who have those connections and, and are able to reach out to their community. If anyone wants to talk about, you know, anything interesting they did through their crowdfunding campaigns to engage folks, go ahead. Yeah, so deep, so I'm from Deep River and um, we're just starting um, this process. And so um, one of the things that we, and, and Roberta dropped off the call, she's the president of our local garden club. So we've engaged them to help with that, but um, we're struggling a little bit with how to get the word out. So that's why I was interested in hearing from your all's perspective of how you started that community engagement, what you used, you know, were there different methods that you used to get the word out, to get the community involved? No, it's a great question, right? I mean, crowdfunding is not something that, uh, I'm not an expert in it. I don't think most yeah. people are experts in <laughs> crowdfunding. I, so uh, if I could share. How yeah, we yeah, go it. ahead. Um, so Pollinated Pathway, you know, first of all, uh, when we signed on as New Haven, they, they actually created a brochure for us. And so we first just went around with the brochure, just explaining to people from the brochure. And then uh, Kim Stoner created um, a blooming plant list. And uh, that's another thing that we went around just showing people, um, you know, in, a, in an urban city, it was, you know, and again, I'm not targeting people who may know a little bit about gardening, targeting everyday people right because you know butterfly bees and birds need to find habitat everywhere not just in the private home residential areas uh, so that's what we sort of did is we went around just talking to people about that um, so that people had a understanding of, of the pot plus we also had it on the Farmington Canal we have a block long pollinative garden there um, that was planted by minorities in a very underserved neighborhood. So it's just 
you know, making people aware and, and some of the education things made it very easy. And during the summertime, going to any kind of festival or, you know, neighborhood, not neighborhood, but city <laughs> thing. And um, I tell you, uh, when we publicized our plant sale, it was just the address. People didn't know it was in this neighborhood because you know how some neighborhoods could be stereotyped, but it was amazing just people coming to the address because of what they, they wanted. So. And Abe, one other thing I would add is that a lot of pollinator pathway towns um, have started Facebook pages. So, the, you know, Deep River um, Pollinator Pathway Facebook page. And you can, you can also easily now, we have a form and it's been really simplified. You can make a, um, a website, a web page as part of the Pollinator Pathway website. You can have a page for your, and then you can link to your Facebook page. So social media seems like, Instagram and Facebook seem like the way I've heard about a lot of the fundraising. Um, I can say too, from our experience, since we're going through it right now and we had no idea what we were doing, um, that we basically put together um, a list of all of the people who have pledged to be on our pathway already. So we had a very specific email that we sent out. We would e-blast, we e-blasted them. And then we went through and made, because we would like to do what Doreen was saying, but a lot of the activities and everything were canceled. So we had to really go directly to um, phone calls and emails, kind of yes. like old school. <laughs> so um, we did we did have blasts on Instagram and Facebook, but we really honed down like groups of, of different people. So we have a lot of, uh, we have the Chapin Point Garden Club on our committee and the Stanford Garden Club. So we, we had a separate form for them and said, please send out to all of your constituents and participants. And they, so they would do e-blast and we would kind of stagger them throughout the week. And then we told all of our members, please donate. So we have money in, in the fund. So people see that it's, it's being um, like, there's money there and reach out to all of your friends and family. So we had different members of the group, like a sending out blasts to all of our neighbors. And then, um, you know, it would kind of peter out a little bit and then we would re-blast again. Oh, just a reminder, please, you know, donate. And a lot of people actually, you know, were receptive to that. We, we did get new, um, we did get new people who donated. And I would say that we saved a few people that we knew wanted to donate, but um, hadn't donated yet. So we save them kind of towards the end. And so now we're sending out more blasts. And since um, Sustainable Connecticut decided to uh, refund, like match our new new goal. So now we're sending out um, more reminders and basically an update saying that we've stretched our goal. So, and, and so far people have been pretty receptive just through sending emails a lot and, and talking to also the garden clubs. The garden clubs have been, I think, pretty integral in like, spreading spreading the word to their community and we've also so we we also have a lot of co-sponsors in Stanford like Louise was talking about like the library and the Bartlett Arboretum um, Fairgate Farm so we sent all of our community partners emails to separately we also actually sent all of our sit everybody we spoke to in the city we sent people um, the, the land use bureau chief donated our senior parks planner donated so anybody that we could think of that was we knew would be um, for planting trees, we we sent them emails. And one way one way to get that initial email list is if you do a Zoom talk like this, and you know Donna or I or, or somebody can come do the talk that I just did, or you know like here's what the pollinator pathway is, and you'll get you'll get the first people that see that and sign up. That's your core group of pollinator pathway that you know there's your staff <laughs> because whoever signed up and then you can start from there to get the word out and if i can just add here in weston um, we raised eight thousand dollars through a community match fund um, and we actually rolled out our pollinator pathway signups in conjunction with the crowdfunding campaign so when people were signing up we had the link so they could make a donation and either purchase a sign or just make a donation to the, the garden project. 
And that was really successful. We only have, you know, we've less than 10,000 people in town, not a lot of commercial basis either. Um, and that was really helpful for us just to kind of get the word out on Facebook and Instagram and all our social media. I know for us, uh, we, we did tackle like other environmental organizations to um, share a little of their funds. And uh, we almost got into a little trouble at the end because uh, one of the requirements is that you needed 20 people to give donations. And we were almost at our goal with half, <laughs> half of that. So, um, you know, the organizations really uh, helped. And uh, one thing about this fund, I tell you, I, I run a nonprofit. There's not many places that you can get funding uh, as a match. So, you know, here I tell everybody about it and uh, Abe shared with me that they're even expanding the type of projects that they will fund. So, I mean, this is the best. This is better than crowdfunding, anything else, because you can use the funds for just about, you know, anything. I can chime in if you want a little info. Um, I'm in Wilton and I'm in the Garden Club here and we have a very active um, group. And we began the pollinator pathway with some amazing people who chair our conservation committee. Um, it's going up through Ridgefield and we tie in with our um, Norwalk River Valley Trail and also Uh oh, do we lose her? I think so. Damn, we lost her. <laughs> well, well uh, if she hops back on uh, I'll open up the floor. Marjorie, I see you have a hand raised. Don't know if that's on purpose, but if it is, feel free to unmute and chime in. Hi, thanks, Abe. Um, I'm in my pajamas, so I'm using my, my photo up there. Um, I've really learned a lot this morning. I want to thank everyone for chiming in. Uh, and Abe, I'll be talking with you, I guess, on the phone pretty soon because we're getting ready to submit our information for the grant. Um, we in East Slime, we had a unique experience. I kind of feel like we're like um, the woman that just spoke and she said there were only like 10,000 members in her 10,000 residents in her town. I think she was from Wilton. Weston. No, Weston. Thank you, Abe. East Slime only has about 19,000 people. Uh, so we don't have any corporation, land trust, college, science center. So we decided to go 501c3 because we weren't sure how we were gonna get our money. And then we partnered with a giving garden on a piece of property uh, that that's being, we're, we're using it um, under the permission of a Baptist church who owns the property for 10 years. So we created a two acre meadow alongside this giving garden that's going to be organic food production for homeless shelters and uh, food uh, distribution in one of our churches here in town. And now we're trying to expand and, and we're, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I'm launching a pollinator pathway in about three weeks. So I need to get signs. I've got, um, I, I, I guess I'm just overwhelmed by everything that I've heard from you all because I've heard so much support from the towns and we have not received really any support from our towns. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm meeting with the first selectmen and the department heads. And I have to tell you, my first selectman told me on the phone yesterday that I had no business talking to the park and rec people or the maintenance staff in town. I had no business calling them. And I was really appalled. I don't know who exactly I'm dealing with here, but I will uh, put on my diplomatic hat and I will try to uh, talk to these people, tell them that it's good for the sustainability of East Slime. They, they think we're a pain in the neck, I'm sorry to say, but we are determined to do this project. We raised the funds for the two acre meadow purely by ten dollars a dollar twenty dollars from my members my board members and i attending farmers markets and setting up an apple picking at local farms haven't received um anything um from any businesses so i'm wondering i've asked people if they would sponsor us and they just look at us and say no 
how do you get these positive results with the town leadership? Um, how do you get support from the political parties, the churches, the library? Um, I've done two PowerPoint presentations for the school system. Uh, we've got 200, I think, and 50 members on our Facebook page. I've got over 70 people signed up for our pollinator pledge so far. So the residents in town are so eager for this. They're cheering us on. But I can't seem to get support from the powers that be. Uh. Yeah. Well, I thank Marjorie for Stanford. Um, we are very lucky. We have people on staff who were already trying to implement some of what we are doing. Um, but our motivation or our goal basically was to go super positive with them and, ex and, and tell them how Stanford could be um, a, a model for other cities and towns and um, just make it really positive and how, how it was good for them. And um, they, as simple as that sounds, um, it actually, I think, really helped some of them change their minds. Like when, when we were meeting um, with some of the attorneys, um, they, they were very skeptical at first. And when, once we showed them how you know, different, um, different levels of managed and no managed lawns, they were very receptive and of with ornamental lawns and and especially if you have a lot of support from the community um you should definitely bring that in uh, how many people you already have on board thanks melanie we i have tried all those approaches um i truly have uh not sure what not sure what the stumbling block is for uh, for concrete but i i have a good suspicion my intuition tells me that we that there is a problem and he'll be leaving in November. His term oh. is up and he's not seeking reelection. Um, there's just, um, yeah, we've tried all that positive, making the town improve, um, the, the support of all the townspeople, but they, um, they just don't seem to care about that. I mean, it's not a motivating factor. I, I actually, I've had a lot of experience with, with uh, <laughs> with uh, reticent town governments. And um, um, here's the, what I would say about this. I think you're asking the wrong person. It's like going to what they, what they call a hardware store for milk, you know, because the selectmen are interested in infrastructure, in roads. They have a lot to keep up. And what really has more clout is is to back up and think of your town as a democracy with people with real interests. And then you have to do the slow process of going to the fairs and showing up and doing town presentations in the library and gradually developing support. And if you want to hit your selectmen with an, with an ask, then use a petition. But the idea of going to them and expecting them to jump on board, and it's not about building a bridge or maintaining a road, is, is just asking the wrong person for the wrong thing. It doesn't work. Yeah. I appreciate what you're saying. Um, I, I've got the Conservation Committee. I've got the Commission on Natural Resources on our side. We've done all the farmers markets. We're doing them again this year. I'm buying a tent. We're, we're outlaying a lot of money. Hopefully, we'll get it back through our sustainable. Uh, crowdfunding. So we're, we've done all that, Catherine. And and this first selectman, he just doesn't want anything going on without his knowledge. He doesn't care that the conservation is backing us. He, he just doesn't care. He said, you know, we just don't have time for this, Marjorie. Our mowers, we don't, we don't need to involve them in what you think is best. Well, appreciate the small wins that come from your from your public and assemble those and make that your focus and make that the thing. Don't focus on a selectman ever. Mar Marjorie, okay. yeah. also be, because he's not running again, uh, educate the people who are running. And That's what I'm doing. Yep. Okay. One, right. one I would other. also make a mention. Um, sorry, my call dropped earlier, but we had a... Um, a big meadow down at Shanks Island in Wilton. And the pollinator group had planted a bunch of stuff in our conservation group, but be aware during COVID last year, 
the mowers didn't get out because every, you know, everything was in lockdown. So they went late and they mowed down the whole thing that was replanted by our group. It, everyone was up in arms. So you, mm. you do need some kind of a sign or some kind of an agreement because you could lose everything that you did in a certain area if the town is responsible for mowing. Um, other groups, I know that um, just to move on, because I, sorry, I dropped earlier. Um, we also do like some farmer's market at our library. I run a youth gardening program at our at teen center. So we have a garden there and we've implemented a pollinator pathway there. Um, the Norwalk River Valley Trail is involved with us. They do things as well, the watershed, um, Trout Unlimited. So the more groups that are environmentally connected that you can reach out to, um, it helps spread the word in those families. As same with um, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Women's mm -hmm. Club in town, we're involved with all of them um, in their children's group from that perspective. So families get to, you know, to know what you're doing they love that their kids are getting involved. So then the kids become part of other groups as they're getting older. That's how we were able to, um, to keep moving. Our historical society also, there's a pollinator garden there. Um, so as many groups as you can connect and spread the word. Um, our town government has given us some flack back too. We're doing a big daffodil explosion here um, and they really didn't want us planting because it was dangerous but we were able to get other properties um, first in line and we we're able to get started this year. And we have the petition in now to please let us do this, but it was a whole big um, production to put something together to ask them for the next few spots. But if you can connect your cemeteries and other big parcels of land and then fill in the rest, that helps get you going. We, we did that. Thanks, Pam. We're working with the Historical Society right now to do a, a small pollinator meadow on one of our historic homes. Okay. So, but, but we didn't need permission from the first selectman to do that. It was the Historical right. Society. Hey, Marjorie, sorry to interrupt here. Bruce, also, I see that you've been raising your hand for a while, so I'll pass off to you as soon as I say this. Guys, I have an 1130 that I'm a couple of minutes late for and, and that I need to get going to. So I don't want to end the meeting. Folks are still talking. This is really interesting. If anyone is free and is planning to stay on, uh, I can make you the host. And then when I drop off, it won't end the meeting. Uh, I asked Louise, but I know you got to get going at 11.45 too. So I won't pass that on to you. Is anyone free and can be the host so that you guys can keep talking when I drop? Anyone? I got to go too. <laughs> I think yeah. we have to go. Let's hear from Bruce though. Well, yeah, Bruce, I, Bruce, the point I wanted to make, I live in Glastonbury and one thing that um, seems to be effective with town government is to have 50 people speak during public comment at a meeting. And it doesn't even have to be on the town agenda, but it's on the citizens agenda to speak about it. And you are present week after week. Um, you know, for us, whether it was a plastic bag ban uh, in town, other things. Um, the town council, all of them are seated in front of you uh, during public comment, and that's a perfect time to express your opinions. Good point. Yeah, and I was going to add, like um, uh, in Wilton, where Pam is, is talking about, um, this that's where the first town that Pollinator Pathway started, and the town really didn't join. They didn't support it originally, but we just kept going, and finally they came around, and they're like, oh, this thing's happening. Uh, it seems like... <laughs> You know, with or without us. So, I think that we, you just have to go forward and little by little and show that this is a positive thing for the town. And I think you can you can win hearts that way. Yeah. So has has anyone engaged nurseries? So you know, I used to live in Waterford. So and I used to go to Smith Acres. Terry is a great resource. I don't know if she has a specific native section, but. I just wonder whether any of you have reached out to nurseries and engaged them about having pollinator sections or native sections. I can yeah. address that. They um, do. I um, approached Terry last fall with a list of plants that we got off the pollinator pathway org and some other plants that most of us are master gardeners. So we did some research and we presented her and two other nurseries and they weren't interested at all. But I, pro I spoke to Louise one day, I was very discouraged and she gave me a word of advice and I approached the woman again 
uh, not really as me, but as, as, a, as a bee and nature advocate, I just put on that cap and I went in and said, you know, Terry, we have over 50 people so far signed up for the pledge. You could really get a lot of traffic in this nursery uh, for people that, you know, don't want the frilly coneflower. They just want the pure echinacea. And she said, you know, I, I'm think, I think I'll do it. So she's bringing in American beauties. And then I said, well, how about giving our pledge card holders a 10% off discount as an, ascent, an incentive? And she said, sure, I can do that. Just so matter of factly was months <laughs> before she said, nope. Yeah. Well, I mean, really one and of the goals of the pollinator pathway is to have people go into their local nursery and say, we need native plants. Can you get us pesticide free native plants? Can we be sure that the seeds haven't been coated in pesticides? And we got to show the nurseries that that there's a market for this, you know, exactly really an important thing. I mean, yes, you can go drive to, you know, earth tones and get beautiful native plants, but it's really important to, to stay with your local um, nursery. And in a couple towns, Darian, for one, they brought the local nursery in as a partner and then started talking to them about, oh, you're selling all this glyphosate, mm. you know, that's kind of a problem. Can you, you know, so really engaging is a great thing. I'm actually going to have to go because I've got another talk at the Norwalk Library. If anybody wants more, come over to the Norwalk Public <laughs> Library. We're going to do another Zoom on this. Um, but I, anybody who's here that is maybe not on our mailing list, go to pollinator-pathway.org. Um, and if you're a town organizer, that it, we we keep a database of town organizers so we can reach out to you with information and you know keep an account of the towns and. Um, so make sure we have your your info. And thanks everybody. This is so inspiring. I love hearing from everybody. Thank you, Louise. Yeah, thanks everyone. This was very good. Thank, Thank you so okay. much. Excellent. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. 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 Good luck.